All right, well, welcome everyone. We're thrilled so many people turned out to discuss the most exciting topic in the world, advanced nuclear energy on this rainy, blustery uh, November afternoon. Uh, 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 we're really glad that everybody could make it. I'm Rich Powell from ClearPath, and I wanna welcome you on behalf of all the co-sponsors of this event. Uh, Third Way, uh, the United States Nuclear Industry Council, the Nuclear Innovation Alliance, and the Atlantic Council. As many of you know, ClearPath is a nonprofit dedicated to policy advocacy around flexible clean energy technologies, for which advanced mm -hmm. nuclear is an extremely important option. NELA, the Nuclear Energy Leadership Act, was introduced last month by the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Chairman Lisa Murkowski, who unfortunately couldn't be here today as she's on a plane right now from Alaska. Uh, that same old excuse she always uses for stuff like this. <laughs> Uh, but I think if she were here, she'd agree that the bill continues a strong bipartisan trend in advanced nuclear policy that began several years ago with the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act, which was passed into law this fall. Chairman Murkowski has already secured 10 co-sponsors for NILA from across the ideological spectrum. Uh, they are Cory Booker, Shelley Moore Capito, Chris Coons, Mike Crapo, Tammy Duckworth, uh, Democratic Wick. Uh, Dick Durbin, Joe Manchin, Jim Risch, and Sheldon Whitehouse. So clearly a very broad ideological spectrum. Uh, that's quite a diverse set of folks, uh, and I should note they are all returning next Congress. Uh, it further shows that not only can nuclear and clean energy policy more broadly be bipartisan, it can be supported for many different reasons, whether it's to address carbon emissions, our national energy and energy security, uh, or just to ensure that America remains at the forefront of next generation zero or low carbon power sources that will dominate the global export market in the coming decades. Uh, so with our co-sponsors, we decided to assemble this event to explore NILA's many innovative proposals for advancing American nuclear innovation and have brought together what I hope you'll agree is a stellar panel of experts from energy security, business, engineering, and law to explain the broad impacts of this bill. Now, before I introduce those panelists, I wanted to take a step back and share a little bit about why we're here. From ClearPath's perspective, nuclear energy is one of the only sources of highly reliable, zero emission energy available, and it has tremendous national security advantages. Nuclear provides the majority of all clean electricity in the United States and enables our Navy's submarines and aircraft carriers missions. At the same time, advanced nuclear reactors being developed by leading American entrepreneurs have the potential for even more national security benefits, whether supporting remote or forward deployed missions or reducing our nuclear waste and plutonium liabilities, all while generating clean electricity. Further, advanced nuclear has the potential to be a crucial export, as it was in the 20th century, supplying clean energy and economic development to partner nations. But that potential future won't happen without real effort. We've seen Russia and China greatly scale up their nuclear energy development over the last few years, including advanced non-light water and floating reactor concepts. They are effectively using nuclear exports as a tool of geopolitical influence rather than an economic opportunity. We're excited about the ideas proposed in NILA and how they can make sure America remains the global clean energy leader. At a 50,000 foot level, NILA does a few things to move nuclear forward. First, it starts with the end in mind, endorsing a grand challenge approach at the Department of Energy by instructing DOE to develop moonshot research and development goals for advanced nuclear, as well as a new strategic plan for the first time in nearly two decades. Second, to support that research push, it provides the key tool needed by our nuclear innovators to develop their designs by authorizing funding for the versatile test reactor that was supported in the NIAICA law earlier this year. Third, once those designs are ready to be built, it allows government to put its electricity purchasing power to work to help demonstrate advanced reactors. Government entities could engage in longer term power purchase agreements up to 40 years, more in line with the power profile from a nuclear power plant, and it also authorizes a pilot PPA program for new advanced reactors, especially for those providing national security or resilient services to the grid. Fourth, it ensures that advanced reactors will have the advanced fuel they need to run by authorizing an interim supply of high assay, low enriched uranium fuel, otherwise unavailable from the private sector, Fifth and last but not least, NILA reauthorizes vital university nuclear engineering programs so we have the top talent to design, build, and operate advanced reactors. Taken together, NILA is a soup to nuts package of DOE ideas that have the potential to keep America ahead in nuclear energy. 
So now we're going to get started with our panel. One last logistical note. Each of the panelists will speak a bit, and then we'll go to questions. I'll ask some. We'd like you to ask some. Uh, everyone has a note card on your seat. So the way that we're going to collect questions is if folks can write their question on their note card and then uh, hand it to the ClearPath associate who will be uh, walking around the room. She'll then uh, take them all and bring them up to me, and I'll go through the questions uh, that way, as opposed to trying to handle the microphone going around the room. So I'm, I'm now going to start with our panelists and turn first to my friend Jane Nakano to discuss the links between national security and advanced reactors. Jane is a senior fellow in the Energy and National Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. Her areas of expertise include U.S. energy policy, global market and policy developments concerning natural gas, nuclear energy and coal, and energy security issues in the Asia-Pacific region. Jane, take it away. Thank you so much, Rich. Um, so, you know, the, in the advanced uh, reactor sector, I, you know, I'm afraid, but I have to say that I think the U.S. is starting to fall behind. As Rich has mentioned, there are countries that are already, you know, developing these technologies. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, some of the, the countries that are leading in this space are not the countries that are particularly, um, that particularly share the values and norms that the United States uh, upholds. Um, he, you know, Rich has already mentioned that, for example, China is already looking at the molten salt, uh, but they've already uh, nearly completed uh, their high temperature uh, gas reactor. They're also looking at uh, small modular reactors as well. Uh, and you know, to China, uh, nuclear is their national focus, both for um, R&D, but then also e for export. Um, it has a s sort of a state finance tool that uh, many uh, OECD economies lack when they try to export their technologies whether it's the conventional size uh, light water reactors or advanced, uh, likely, I mean, advanced reactors in the future. Also, Russia. Russia is actually already an established supplier in this uh, current generation of fleet, um, but they're also looking uh, at this uh, nuclear as a strategic business. Um, their foreign ministry is in charge of promoting exports abroad. It's a very different setup from what uh, we have in the U.S. currently. They're also looking at small modular reactors uh, for um, certainly for deployment, but uh, likely for exports as well down the road. Um, in, the, in the interest of time, I just wanted to say there are two areas that come to my mind when I think of uh, the national security implications of the U.S. Uh, inability to compete in the advanced reactor sector. One concerns foreign policy uh, uh, yeah, influence. The linkage between nuclear commerce and foreign policy influence is nothing new, right? Um, and but you know, for but you know, there are some great examples. For example, uh, Rosatom of Russia is currently building a reactor in Hungary, using it, which is financed by the loan from Russia. Uh, the idea is for uh, Russia to then supply fuel, but then also to operate it. Uh, it's expected to further cement uh, Russia's ties with this, um, the current uh, Hungarian government, which is very pro-Moscow. Uh, um, and you know, to look at this sort of a linkage between nuclear commerce and um, foreign policy influence uh, uh, from a different angle, uh, as you know, uh, relates to the U.S., currently we have many light water reactor, uh, uh, reactors around the world that we've sold. And you know, uh, which have augmented uh, our ties with these uh, economies around the world. Um, you know, as these reactors do have to get uh, retired uh, in the coming years, or perhaps you know, maybe decades for some of them. And but if we do not have advanced reactors to offer to as replacement, and if other economies come in, um, you know, it's you know, the the foreign policy influence that we currently enjoy could be offset. Um, the second area is really the international uh, U.S. leadership in international or global nuclear safety and security. Um, you know, the U.S. very much started the era of uh, nuclear power generation. You know, uh, light water reactor technology dominance has very much um, uh, made U.S. Uh, the leader in uh, both operational safety and non-proliferation non issues. As we look at these advanced reactors and the type of fuels and characteristics that might become necessary, um, I, you know, I would expect that there will be new requirements or, or additional requirements or even 
potentially new approaches to uh, not, uh, both safety, but then also non-proliferation nuclear security uh, to keep the, the security regime uh, that's sound and vibrant. Um, so, you know, if we do lose, or if we don't even get into uh, this advanced nuclear uh, um, sector, um, then, you know, we would not have anything to offer. And um, I am not saying that other countries would not have interest in upholding uh, norms and standards. However, uh, you know, if we do not have technologies to underpin, uh, uh, then you know, I think we will be uh, uh, much worse off in being able to really um, continue to push for the high standards um, and strong norms. Um, so, you know, there are many other national security implications, but, you know, I, I can't say enough, uh, I can't emphasize enough that these are serious implications and also they're real. So the stake is high. That's it for me for now. Great. Thank you very much, Jane. We'll come back to a number of those themes in a few minutes. Um, first, we'll next uh, introduce uh, Dr. Mark Peters to share some thoughts on the potential for a moonshot goal approach to nuclear innovation, uh, the need for a versatile test reactor, and the workforce priorities that are uh, indicated in this, in this legislation. Uh, Mark is director of the Idaho National Laboratory with responsibilities for management and integration of a large multi-purpose lab whose mission focuses on nuclear energy, national and homeland security, and energy and environmental science and technology. Mark has an extensive background in the Department of Energy, Nuclear Energy R&D, and lab management at both Idaho and Argonne National Labs. Mark, take it away. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, nice to be with you all today. Um, and I also wanted to thank Senator Murkowski and all the, all the senators who co-sponsored NILA. It's an important step building on NECA, uh, the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act, and taking some important next steps to, to furthering nuclear energy as an option for the future. Um, so, so as Rich said, I, I was going to speak to more of the to more of the sort of research and development aspects of, of NILA, um, and I'll have more to say hopefully in discussion about some of the other aspects because there's a lot to like in, in NILA about what we'll, what what we need to further nuclear energy. So everybody, many of you in the room know the value proposition. It's about reliable, resilient, clean energy for the future, and so the promise of advanced nuclear re, uh, reactor systems in particular is quite exciting, an opportunity for the United States, I would argue, to actually leap back into, the, into a leadership position, uh, go forward. Um, as Rich mentioned, one of the, one of the key uh, parts of NILA relates to moonshot and tying quantitative me measures and goals to enabling advanced nuclear energy systems. So as is mentioned in NILA, there's many aspects uh, of advanced nuclear systems that we're interested in, right? It's, it's less waste production, less spent fuel production, more, more reliable, more efficient, uh, more accident tolerant fuels, uh, more proliferation resistant, all these systems level goals. But uh, the other thing that I will mention in particular is economics, right? If, if, if we're serious about enabling advanced nuclear, we're gonna have to drive down costs at the system level and the subsystem level as well. And so the, the idea of putting, putting together for the Department of Energy Office of Nuclear Energy a moonshot type goal where you're going after demonstrating advanced systems urgently in, an, in the next decade, which is very aggressive, but I think important for the United States to maintain leadership, but also tie that to concrete opportunities to cut costs and also make the systems more efficient. Uh, a lot of the metrics that we're talking about with safety, security, uh, spent fuel yield and cost are inherently measurable. Uh, so you could, you could imagine, not that the Department of Energy doesn't do this already, uh, but I think we can be much more rigorous about tying concrete goals to our R&D programs that are conducted at the laboratories and the universities in cooperation with industry. So I think that's a really st a, a huge step forward, as Rich mentioned. Asking the department to sit down and write that down in a strategic plan, deliver that, and then manage to it, I think is a really, really important, important step forward. And, and, and some of these systems we're talking about, very aggressive. Uh, you're talking about microreactors in the, say, early mid-20s. Uh, Chris will talk more about small, light water small modular reactors in the mid-20s. And then think about being able to demonstrate, say, order four for advanced systems in 2028. So the department is doing things. You've heard, many of you have heard of GAIN, the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear. We are thinking about how to accelerate innovation and how to accelerate deployment. But this, NILA takes, I think, takes us to the next step in really pushing us in that direction. Uh, 
Another important aspect that, as Rich mentioned, I, I wanted to speak to is the, the versatile test reactor. We call it the versatile test reactor. Uh, you'll hear it referred to as the versatile fast neutron source. So w w what motivates that, that in, in NELA? Um, if you look at the testing capabilities in the United States, you look at a lot of the advanced nuclear reactor systems, several of the, several of the concepts ha are operating in the fast spectrum, fast neutron spectrum, um, as opposed to the current fleet, which is a thermal neutron spectrum, slower neutrons. So the, currently, the United States does not have a fast neutron testing capability, right? We had EBR1, EBR2 in Idaho, and we also had FFTF, the Fast, fast Flux Test Facility, at, at the Hanford site in Washington. Those, cap those capabilities have since left, so right now, if a US-based company or university or lab wants to go and test in the fast spectrum, they're faced with going overseas to places like China and Russia to find that capability. So the Office of Nuclear Energy through the Nuclear Energy Advisory Committee a couple years ago actually ha did a robust analysis of should we fill this gap uh, in the United States with a fast te testing capability? And the determination of them at the time was yes, the Office of Nuclear Energy should start to explore that. And so that got authorized again in NECA and again in, in NILA. So we are working, Idaho's working with Oak Ridge and Argonne, Los Alamos, and PNL in the lab space. We've got university partners, uh, industry starting to get engaged. Uh, in fact, just about an hour ago it went public. We've signed a contract with Jihi Itachi to come in and help us with the design process. That just be, We just signed that contract late last week. So it's getting serious. We're starting to ramp up, moving into a conceptual design phase. For those of you who speak DOE project, we're, we're operating according to the 413 order, so we'll go through the critical decision process. Uh, we'll be delivering uh, critical decision zero, which is a mission need for, for the versatile test reactor in January, and then we'll move very quickly into the design phase. This is gonna require resources, but we've got a team built that we think can be quite successful. And that will allow us to test a wide range of materials, fuels, and the fast spectrum, and really will be an important part of maintaining that R&D leadership in the United States. And then the final point I'd make, as Rich also pointed out, is there's important provisions in NELA uh, uh, related to workforce, and that's university programs uh, and continuing to train, to educate and train the next generation. And that's an integrated effort amongst the universities, industry, and the national labs to train that next generation. I'm very, very excited about the future of nuclear, and, and it's interesting, the, the, uh, the, the younger generations are also interested, and a lot of it's coming from in their view, the urgent need to address climate change. And so to me, that's a very exciting opportunity. So bringing those young people in and the things that NILA contemplate with continuing to authorize important university research programs, cooperation with the laboratories are absolutely vital to our future. And I'll stop there. Great, thanks very much, Mark. So we've heard from Jane about sort of the national security imperative and getting these things up and running and becoming competitive again. We've heard from Mark, about the sort of basic and early applied research and enabling our designers uh, to bring these concepts to reality. Chris is then in the private sector thinking about actually bringing one of these things online, and so he's going to share a little bit his thoughts about the provisions of NILA that focus on the federal government's ability to use power purchase agreements to scale up these technologies. Uh, Chris is the chief strategy officer of New Scale Power, which is developing an advanced small modular reactor. Chris has spent nearly two decades developing and financing nuclear and fossil power facilities. Chris, take it away. Thank you. Um, so New Scale Power, as uh, Rich mentioned, we're developing a small modular light water reactor. Um, we're one of the older of the new advanced reactor companies. We were formed back in 2007. And so far, we've invested about $800 million into our design, both licensing and engineering for it. And we are looking to have our first plant operational in 2026 at the Idaho National Laboratory this gentleman knows very much about, um, and would be owned by Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems, a um, joint action agency headquartered in Utah. But one of the key things that, that UNIRAPS is finding is that, you know, basically they use all the power for their members. And when they do that, having that ability to work with the Department of Energy and other federal agencies to take a portion of that um, output from a plant uh, by way of a power purchase agreement is a key de-risking uh, element as they look at it going forward. So the fact that we can go from a 10-year um, to a 40-year PPA and the possibility of under NELA having uh, pilot power purchase agreements to go after those elements of advanced reactors that people are looking for, whether it be resiliency, whether it be hybrid energy, whether it be other types of attributes, uh, is important to have that ability for the federal government to do that. 
Um, I can't mention how important it is for uh, UAMPS. I've been actually out to uh, the UAMPS membership and had, it's been over 100 public meetings uh, with town councils and other uh, local bodies. And the minute we start talking about the potential for Department of Energy, PPAs, and the government support, uh, it's very instrumental to their decision to be moving forward. So I'll, I'll leave my, my comments at that, but um, much of what uh, the other things folks talked about, I can dig into a little bit, is having gone through the path of um, early development and uh, into the deployment phase. So I'll leave it there, Rich. Great, short and sweet, perfect. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Chris. <laughs> So now moving on from, okay, we're gonna demonstrate these things. A number of these advanced reactor concepts are, are gonna need a different kind of fuel. And so uh, Anne is gonna share some thoughts about the provisions in NILA that would address fuel for advanced nuclear reactors. She is a senior associate at Pillsbury Law Firm. Uh, she's represented energy clients in a variety of different matters, ranging from international arbitration to practice before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and atomic safety and licensing boards, including the construction and operation of new nuclear power plants. Anne, why don't you close us out? Thank you. Um, and it's Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman, who, are, if anyone wants the really, really long name for the law firm versus just the Pillsbury Law Firm. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, high assay, low enriched uranium, which is the sort of the new fuel type that we're looking at using in advanced reactors. Uh, modern reactors, or existing reactors rather, use enriched uranium that's generally enriched below 5% U-235. The reactors going forward are looking at using between 5% and 20% enriched uh, uranium. So that's, it's a really different <coughs> framework than what we're working with now. And the problem with that is that there really is no existing capability to produce this fuel. But the fuel is necessary. Um, it's necessary to have demonstration plants that can get up and running, and it's necessary to demonstrate that these advanced designs can be commercial, that they will work, and that we can move forward with creating our advanced reactor designs and commercializing them. Um, in terms of the commercial side, it, it's expected to take seven to ten years to get the capability up and running to produce high assay, low enriched uranium fuel. Um, but the DOE has uh, more availability to produce that material because they have stocks of HEU and they have a variety of other ways of producing it. So what this bill does is it sets forth a goal or rather a mandatory amount of HEU that the, um, the DOE will produce using either its stocks of high enriched uranium or its existing high assay LEU. Um, and that's actually an amount of high assay LEU that the DOE will produce. So the DOE is set to use, um, I believe, two metric tons of U-235 by the end of 2022 to create high assay low enriched uranium. And then it would be 10 metric tons by the end of 20, uh, the end of 2025 and two metric tons by the end of 2022. So this uh, U-235 would be used to create HALEU for advanced reactors to use in demonstration plants and just to get the ball rolling in the industry. This is a great start. It gives advanced reactors the ability to demonstrate what they can do um, and to just get that ball rolling. Um, there are still some requirements before we move on to the commercialization of HALEU. From, uh, more on the NRC side, there's going to have to be looking at the transportation casks. Um, they're going to have to evaluate whether or not there's going to be new transportation casks or whether you would use high enriched uranium transportation casks. Um, and there's also going, the NRC is going to have to take a look at their materials controls and accountability and security requirements and really modify some of that going forward. But this is really, it's a great start to get off the ground and running and to take a look at what advanced reactors can do. And thanks very much. Um, you know, I, I want to first just continue on this uh, advanced fuels and Haley point a bit. Mark, I wonder if you can share your thinking on this provision as well, because I know that this is also something you've been looking at quite a bit in INL. Yeah, so the, so the advanced reactor developers, as, as Anne already said, they're almost just about everyone you talk to says we want to operate at closer to 20 percent, as close as possible to 20 percent enrichment, uh, which is what you hear it called HALU, but that's high SALU. 
uh, pushing it above 5% up to the, the max of 19.99999. Um, <laughs> right, right. Uh, so, so, but there's, there's, there's the existing uh, feedstock, I'll call it, as, as was alluded to, but there's also opportunities uh, there's other options that that the that the, the nation's actually thinking about where you could generate high SALU. One, uh, some of them are what I would term more back end approaches. Uh, like for example, we treat experimental breeder reactor two uh, spent fuel at INL already for ultimate disposal in a repository. You could accelerate that treatment and generate quite a bit of high SALU from from that process. Um, there's also uh, technology that we're developing at the laboratories. That, that you could potentially treat Navy fuel and also generate quite a bit of high SALU. And then you can also think about reestablishing enrichment capability in the United States. All those are potential options that one could look at as well as just looking at the existing stockpile of HEU. So there's, there's active research, and all, some of those are all, all the way to the point of being able to be demonstrated. Terrific. So we've raised a lot of issues here already. I have a lot of questions. If anyone else wants to get a question in here, I'll remind you, you're going to write down on your card the question. You're going to hold it up, and Shah from the ClearPath team is going to be collecting them and bringing them back here. Um, but I want to start by talking a little bit about uh, how do we go from zero to one? So how do we actually get um, some of these things built? Um, clearly, this legislation would offer new policy tools to enable that. There's already an ecosystem of existing policy supports and tools available to the government. Um, and so, uh, Chris, I wonder if we could first turn to you as somebody who is trying to get one of these things built. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the existing federal financing regime and support regime um, for this, and then how some of these new provisions would you know potentially play into that uh, regime as, as you're seeing it at New Scale? Yeah, so, I mean, New Scale, we're the developer of the technology. We'll provide the technology to our customers. And, and you know, over the last several years, we've benefited from cost share from the Department of Energy. Uh, I mentioned $800 million invested, 250 million of that came from Department of Energy. Um, and likewise, our first customer, UAMS, is a beneficiary of a limited amount of, of funding for the coal development. But when you look at putting out the first of anything, it always costs more. It's just the, the way it is. And the question is, nobody wants to pay more for the first one. They want to pay the nth price. They want to pay what everybody after him is going to pay. And in the case of UAMS or other customers in the market, uh, they look at that being really the alternative for a natural gas combined cycle plant. So if you look at the, the, the gap of a first of a kind new scale plant to an nth of a kind or to a gas plant, there's maybe about a $20 gap per megawatt hour. And the way you close that gap is you have the various tools available of cost share, production tax credits for advanced nuclear, the Dewey Loan Guarantee Program Office, um, and then you know potentially PPAs being the next increment of how you close that gap. But that's what we're really focused on uh, at New Scale of using all those tools that are available to make sure we can close that gap so that the first customer isn't paying a penalty for being first. He needs to pay the same or do a little bit better than everybody else who comes after him because there is a risk for the first plant. So those you know, elements we see there, um, very important, the, the PPA and the potential of a pilot program for the PPAs, uh, very important. And I would say that a number of the other elements of it um, if they were existing, you know, we kind of look at ourselves as the trailblazer as being the oldest new advanced reactor company. Um, a number of the things are going to help those folks coming after us, not only what we've done, but also what this act would do uh, to really enable those folks to be you know, more successful and hopefully do it at a faster pace than us. I mean, we started in 2007. Our first plant will be operational in 2026. I'd like to see that cycle time to get down to 10 years. So hopefully Neil moves it in that way. I like that, the oldest new reactor company. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so someone in the audience asked actually exactly what I was hoping then to turn to Jane to. So another new policy instrument that's just uh, been enacted is the BUILD Act. Um, and so the question from the audience is, how can nuclear best position itself in the $60 billion portfolio of the new uh, DFC, and they quote a CRS report which notes that China has stated they are preparing a $1,600 billion or $1.6 trillion, for those who struggle with math like I do, build out for the Belt and Road, including 30 reactors abroad by 2040. And so how uh, could our tool 
help us compete and get one of these things built abroad. So the, the way that the existing vehicles have had um, different types of limitations, whether it's the, the spending cap or the, you know, the, I guess, certain guidelines within the OPEC uh, uh, were not, uh, um, you know, presented a challenge to nuclear. I, I think that the, under the BUILD Act, um, obviously the details are uh, forthcoming, but the International uh, Development Finance Corp uh, has potential to uh, help uh, level the field, uh, playing field. Um, but the, to some extent, I think the way that a Chinese or, you know, or uh, countries with um, uh, non-market driven, or what's the best way to say it, so that, that with the state uh, financing and the state-owned enterprises compete, we wouldn't, it, it'd be, it's always, uh, it's hard to compete in the, in the very same uh, manner. So the idea is really uh, to uh, try to leverage what we got. You know, we will not be, uh, I don't think, creating state-owned uh, nuclear uh, company in this country. Also, we wouldn't be able to just tell taxpayer, we will be spending $1.6 trillion just to give, not give, but export reactors abroad. There are all these uh, different checks and balance uh, in this country. So, But the idea is to really um, um, try to... Uh, um, help the, the con uh, U.S. companies. Uh, what's interesting to me from what I understand is that the, the spending cap for the, the International Development Finance Corp is not just higher, it's, you know, it's uh, at $60 billion. But it's also uh, trying to be able to get into the middle, um, I guess, uh, upper middle economies uh, on the different uh, several grounds. One is national security. Uh, the other one is uh, for development purposes, but in the underdeveloped portions or parts of uh, the given economy. Also, it's seeking to be able to have different uh, financial tools like equity investment. So it certainly opens up now, you know, whether it's, um, it's sufficient uh, uh, to, you know, for the, if this uh, vehicle uh, is sufficient for the U.S. companies to, to fully uh, uh, compete, I, I'm not sure. I think it's a necessary step. I think uh, there are more uh, ways that the government uh, agencies, uh, together with the industry and national labs, can really position themselves as really Team USA uh, if we are to seriously compete against countries that do have very different setup, uh, the industry-government relations, as well as the type of financial tools. So that's sort of my take for now. Chris, do you have anything to add on that? Have you been looking at um, BUILD and the new DFC as an opportunity? I was going to jump and take the mic if you didn't let me answer that question, Rich. Um, yeah, so we have a lot of this. So in the, for New Scale, we see about 75% of our market being overseas, and there's a huge demand for the technology that American companies are, are building. One, because um, I think it is advanced and a step above where the international competition is. And second, it has the, the you know, U.S. NRC good seal of approval um, moving it forward. So when we have a conversation with um, countries such as Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, Slovak Republic, Czech Republic, um, you know, they're, they come away very impressed with the U.S. technology, not just ours, other folks as well. The next question they ask is, you know, when is it going to be ready? When are you going to have one operating in the United States? Our answer is 2026, a little bit of a groan. The third question is, okay, can you guys bring some financing with that? And that's just the really, you know, for lack of a better term, the buzzkill uh, in the conversation. Because up to that point, they're generally very excited about the technology, they're very excited about the safety, and they're very keen to have, you know, seeing it being demonstrated in the United States. I think with the BUILD Act, you know, presuming that the prohibition on nuclear is not carried over from OPEC uh, will be a great um, leveler for... Uh, U.S. industry. You know, it doesn't need to be 100% U.S. financing, just like you don't need 100% of the output from Department of Energy going to PPAs. You just need a piece of it to give that confidence and comfort to people that the U.S. government is there because people want our technology. You know, we just have to make it easier for them to get it, and this is one of the ways of doing it. Um, and you and the team at Pillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw, and... Putnam? It's 
Okay. <laughs> Close enough. Uh, work with, um, I'm always I'm surprised by the breadth of the advanced reactor developing community um, you representing or working with. And I wonder, sort of in this theme of going from zero to one and actually getting something built, if you can give us your quick snapshot of, you know, where your clients are um, and what, you know, you see as the key challenges they're looking at right now. Uh, I think our, a lot of our clients are still sort of in the developmental stages, but um, they were very excited about the 40-year power purchase agreement. It's just a it's, it's such an opportunity because, you know, these costs, they aren't recoverable in 10 years. Um, and uh, giving that longer lead time to the, to, the, to the energy or to the developer to recover their costs and recover all of their research costs, because, you know, the research costs at this point, they're, a lot of them are just investing and hoping that in the end it works out. And we really do need to foster that, that investment and foster that development and that innovation in the U.S., but it's a, it's a long gamble for some of these people at this point. And um, the 40-year power purchase agreement is it's a great step um, in that regard. Mark, a question for you. Um, you know, as we think about what these things need, you know, they need financing, they need fuel, they need land, they need a space. And so uh, one of the great developments in the Nyika Pill, which was again signed into law by President Trump this fall uh, after a three-year journey through, through Congress, um, it, it authorized demonstrations of advanced reactors on DOE-owned facilities. Obviously, the Idaho National Laboratory would be a, a prime place, given its long history, for demonstrating all kinds of things out there. I wonder if you can say a little bit about sort of how you are seeing that development with NYICA and conversations that you're having, if any, with advanced reactor developers about um, building something in addition to new scale out on your piece of land. Yeah, so in, in, in NECA, it's, it's termed the National Reactor Innovation Center is the formal, is the formal uh, designation. And, it, it, and so we are actively working, for those of you who don't know Idaho and, and Idaho National Lab, it's 890 square miles of high desert. Uh, we built 52 reactors from 1949 to present out there, so we still operate four test reactors. But it's an example of why, comp why UAMPS and NewScale are coming and looking at our site. Uh, as a, so to me, this gentleman and his company in partnership with UAMPS are really the first mover on what I would consider more, more to come. Uh, several of the advanced reactor developers, some have gotten pretty darn serious with this, have taken the model that NewScale and UAMPS have applied and have come to us and have st already started to talk seriously about what it would take to demonstrate on our site. Um, the National Reactor Innovation Center naturally could take advantage of Idaho, but I view it as take advantage of multiple government sites. Uh, we haven't mentioned too much about, yet about DOD, but uh, when you talk about how to get from zero to one, uh, perhaps first mover in the DOD space, particularly in the microreactor space, could be well worth considering. But we're actively working to designate and understand what National Reactor Innovation Center means in Idaho in particular. And, and how we can be an important. So I, what I say often is we're open for business, right? We, 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 it's, it's, a, it's an area that's in general favorable, favorable to nuclear. It's, it's, it's our heritage. Uh, so so uh, to be able to come in and demonstrate these, if we're going to demonstrate in the U.S., I'd like to see a lot of that happen in Idaho. And then, and then, and then it's an opportunity for export and leadership from that perspective. And, of course, there are also terrific sites in Tennessee and in Washington State and in a number of other, you know, facilities. There, there, there are. Yeah. There are. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'm a lab guy, so I'm always a little yeah. bit parochial. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, you, but you mentioned Tennessee. I mean, you know, the idea of, uh, of an SMR, say, in Tennessee Valley Authority, a ter Lightwater SMR in Tennessee Valley Authority territory, for example, uh, in my mind, it'd be great to have two, one, one down in TVA territory and one out, one out in the Mountain West. Uh, and then and then let those guys go and, and sell them all over the world. Can I actually ask you one quick follow-up to that? Uh, and I am hogging the mic here, so if other folks have questions, uh, please put up cards. Um, uh, you mentioned this terrific development that you've kind of narrowed things down to GE Hitachi to help you think through um, developing the, ver the versatile test reactor. In some sense, that is a demonstration advanced reactor. Um, and I wonder if you can tell say a little bit, you know, not only about how this is going to be used as a tool to help others, but you know, to what extent is this itself going to be demonstrating an advanced reactor technology? Well, it's, it's likely to be, to, to generate the fast spectrum, the most mature technology is a sodium-cooled system. We've done that before. Uh, we've done it with the test reactors that I rattled off during my introduction. And so in some sense, it's not a demonstration of a specific concept, but it will be a, a sodium-fast reactor. And one of the big reasons why you bring G. Hitachi to the table is because back in the 
in the uh, integral fast reactor days back in the 80s and 90s, they took what was then uh, a design that was a, a government, de government design and, and worked with Argonne at that time, and it became PRISM. And so, so GE Hitachi can bring all those learnings, all that investment that was made by themselves as well as the federal government to the, to the table. So we will be able to generate certain sodium fast reactor concepts, but I would say more broadly, when you think about advanced reactor systems, you're talking about in general classes, liquid metal cooled, high temperature gas, or molten salt. And so we're working on designs with industry, with universities, to be able to have test loops for all those coolants. So you'd be able to look at the response of all the different reactor systems, materials, and fuels in a fast spectrum in that test reactor. So it'll really be a multi-purpose, I'll call it a multi-purpose reactor. It's really exciting. Um, so uh, nuclear, as many of us know, has been a, a tough slog uh, in the United States in the, in the past decade. And I think there's a general recognition that we can do nuclear innovation better than we have been doing it. Um, and so Chris, I wonder if we can first turn to you um, you know, you've seen now uh, the challenges in the AP1000, and knock on wood, we will complete two of those in the United States, but they may well be the last two large light water designs, um, certainly that scale and requiring that much construction uh, in the U.S. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, um, as a developer, what lessons have you learned from that, and what are you planning to do differently um, on new scale to avoid some of those mistakes? Yeah, so... You know, keep in mind that the AP-1000s came in under the NP-2010 program, and we're meant to sort of demonstrate and exercise a whole bunch of new regulatory regimes and, and processes. Um, and there's learning in that, and we're definitely going to be benefiting from that learning. Um, you know, so far, you know, just starting from the whole NRC process of their design certification, uh, taking uh, the period of time it did and the amount of resources it took. So far, we're about a year and a half into our NRC review. We're on schedule. We're on budget. Um, that would not have been the data point you would have extracted from what the AP1000 experience was. But that really put paid to the notion that, you know, once you've demonstrated and worked something in the kinks or the bugs out of a new regulatory process or anything new, the second time around is much easier because you benefit from that learning. Um, and I think that is going to be true in the, the construction of the facilities. Um, you know, it, there's been a number of, of reports and, and studies uh, pointing to where um, we can improve with the implementation and deployment. And, you know, most recently there was a MIT Future of Nuclear report. And what they pointed out was just the simple things. You know, have your design complete. Put in the project management controls. Have your constructor and your, your manufacturers on board prior to going into the field. Um, have a design that's not going to change once you have it licensed by the NRC. So all those things um, we see as lessons that we are going to be able to learn. The challenge is those things, you know, planning costs a lot. Doing all that planning and design and engineering and preparation takes a lot of upfront investment to make that pay off. Uh, so that typically has been the challenge, I think, uh, with folks because you can look to places where they do the planning and they do multiples. And you look at you know lessons in Japan or South Korea where they've been able to do multiples on time, on schedule, and each one cheaper and quicker, quicker than the next. So it is possible. It is doable. Um, we just need to do it. We need to invest to do it. Uh, our first customer in New Scale, we've decided that we're going to be 80% design complete before we go into the field. Uh, that'll be far beyond where most other folks are. But if we can take care of that aspect of just building large civil structures, we'll be fine. Because the good news is the AP-1000 is operating. So it's not a technology challenge. It's really can you pour concrete, can you pull cable, and can you lay pipe in a way that's effective and, and, and timely. And that's what we need to do. And we're well on our way to doing that. Um, one of the... Uh, points in NILA is the requirement that the Department of Energy um, craft a strategic plan. And uh, so, Jane, you and I spent some time in Canada last week uh, touring their nuclear infrastructure. Uh, and I was struck on Wednesday by their announcement that Canada has created a, a national roadmap for demonstrating, uh, they call them just SMRs, they really mean advanced reactors, small modular reactors, and VSMRs, very small modular reactors. Uh, and I wonder if you can say a word about sort of what, you know, what we heard in, in Canada and how they've 
in some sense, kind of gotten ahead of us crafting a plan to get this done. Sure. Um, so um, I was struck by the, the very clear articulation by the national or their federal government about how they view nuclear, which is they say it in the roadmap, but then re they repeatedly say at the conference uh, that where they launched the roadmap that nuclear energy is their strategic asset. Now, Canada has a lot of uranium mining industry as well as you know fuel fabrication. They do not uh, enrich uh, uranium, from what I understand, because CANDU uses um, design uses natural uranium. But they, they do have the supply chain, uh, the, the, the cycle that they do um, see as uh, uh, industry that, is, uh, that makes the country very competitive. They also look at nuclear, uh, nuclear's benefits, um, you know, the clearly the, um, not just the economic and, and job creation benefits, but they clearly articulate that it has climate benefit as well. Uh, so the way that they really um, uh, uh, put the focus, clear focus, and but then also try to then uh, have this Team Canada approach, not just the federal government, but uh, they included a lot of provincial governments uh, that are interested in the potential of uh, uh, small advanced nuclear uh, for a remote location or mining industry uh, or heat uh, to use a heat um, as, use it as a heat source. Uh, and then have this, you know, uh, close relationship among the government, uh, industry, and, and, and their uh, national nuclear lab. Um, I was also struck by how much emphasis they are putting as part of that conversation on the supply chain, not just the whole uranium and et cetera, but all these different equipment and component suppliers have been uh, investing uh, quite a bit in their capacity. Uh, the immediate reason is because uh, Canada is spending $26 billion to refurbish uh, about 10 reactors, existing reactors, but they're hoping to really benefit from that supply, capa uh, supply chain um, revitalization, if you will, to be able to then stay competitive and seize the, the opportunity that may uh, arise from the advanced uh, small modular or advanced or end small modular um, uh, uh, development uh, or marketing uh, in the coming decades. So that was my takeaway. My takeaway was that I was very glad uh, that Rita uh, uh, Berenwald was there in the audience uh, for the launch of that, because she, as the incoming Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy here in the United States, would be the one helping craft this plan. And yeah. so um, very glad to see that, you know, perhaps some inspiration mm -hmm. for, sure. you know, for, for how it's done, done well. Um, uh, Mark, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about how you would then, you know, take this sort of plan and this aspiration and turn it into, you know, reality. You've, you've talked a lot about, you know, setting these aggressive goals and then managing to the goals. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the rubber would hit the road at a facility like yours and how that would influence decision making. And then also how you might think about working with the private sector in order to accomplish some really aggressive goals like that. So, so I mean, well, first and foremost, if you if you lay out a coherent strategic plan slash roadmap, it guides it guides the, the federal investment, and as you can imagine, as a federal laboratory, we 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 respond to that. Uh, so, so, but but to have that focus, that's the way you have the conversation between the department and and OMB, and then with Congress. Um, and so, I, I would argue that a lot of the pieces already exist. I just don't think it's been put into quite as coherent a strategy and a roadmap as we would like. I, I, I have to say something about Ken. I give them a lot of credit, but I would say all the pieces that they've, that they've been able to put together, we have. Uh, so, so I don't think we're in, they're not inventing something that we don't have up there. It's just a question of, I think, focus. Um, that would be my, first, my only comment, I'd say. And we need to get better at marketing ourselves, as, uh, as you've said. I'm not allowed to use yeah. that word. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry, yeah. Yeah. right, not marketing. <laughs> Expressing your technical expressing capabilities. Expressing our technical capabilities. Yes, yes, right, thank yeah. you. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Mark, I'm going to ask you a quick follow-up question, which is you mentioned uh, the Department of Defense a little earlier, and we're lucky to have Alex Beeler here in the audience, who's the uh, soon to be the incoming secretary for uh, buildings and installations for, for the Army, who's a potential buyer for some of these technologies. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how an SMR might fit into uh, DOD facility planning, um, and you know, as in, especially insofar as as INL is serving both 
the civilian nuclear apparatus and the uh, and the military nuclear apparatus. Well, it's when you particular go to, I'll take it to a very, I guess the formal, I call them micros, but I'm talking very small. So sort of in the two to 20 megawatt range. I think that's where DOD gets quite, quite excited and different parts of DOD, the installations folks, strategic capabilities office, perhaps the army, uh, uh, others. Um, and it's for both operate, it's for, for energy security in the sense of a base, but it's also for forward operating areas and transportable is key. Uh, so you go to small, that's, that's, a, that's a key requirement. But there are several designs that are in this very small sort of micro range that are out there in the private sector right now. Uh, some more mature than others in terms of their technology readiness level, if you want to put it that way. Um, but a lot of these are, are the, the designs are relatively simple, and, and they, they, they contemplate things like autonomous control and all kinds of things that would make them very, very attractive. So, so you could imagine a government site being again, a first mover for a demo. And then once you demonstrate some of these technologies, then it, then it could really expand into the DoD market. But also these, but then let's, let's take it to Alaska. Let's take it to remote, the Canadians are talking a lot about deploying these in remote areas of Canada where they're subsidizing diesel. So you can get cost competitive with a subsidized diesel real quick if you're in a nuclear company. So the Canadians are talking about that. I mean, there's conversations going on in Alaska related to that. So, so I think there's a lot of, um, I'm a big fan of small and very small. Uh, not that the AP1000 isn't a great machine and, and a safe reactor, but, but to me, the future energy system is going to need these kind of sort of agile, agile machines that fit into a different kind of energy system. Yeah. Small is beautiful. So I'm being told we're, we're getting the hook here, so I'm going to ask one last question, unless someone from the audience has a, has a burning one. And, and I'll ask Anne one last question. So we've talked a little bit about what's um, in NILA on fuel uh, and nuclear fuel. What else needs to happen uh, in order to get uh, HALU up and running and available to developers? Well, there's a lot. There's uh, several changes in the NRC regulations, and quite frankly, just there's just the building of infrastructure within the United States. We just don't have that infrastructure capability and the and any licensed facilities to really uh, create the HALU. So, in terms of commercialization, there would be regulatory changes. There would be um, the development of transportation casks that can accommodate the material, and there there would also just be the the development of the infrastructure itself. Um, in terms of what the DOE is doing, the DOE actually issued um, an environmental assessment, I think on October 31st, for the generation of some HALU, where they're looking at uh, the electrometallurgical treatment of sodium-bonded fuel at INL. Um, so it, I think that's they're working on figuring out how to get to where they need to be to start creating the, the HALU. But in terms of commercialization, where you're really looking at some new, or new regulatory regime and the actual capability to generate the fuel. Great, thank you. Well, uh, we are now getting the hook, so I want to, on behalf of ClearPath and all of the co-sponsors of this event, uh, once again thank uh, Chairman Murkowski and the 10 co-sponsors of this legislation for their leadership on advanced nuclear energy. And thank you all for coming and for listening. <laughs>